is that those early years in education for children are not just important, they're essential. The brain is forming. They're building, the brains are building those connections. And that is one of the most important points of intervention when it comes to education for kids. At this time, I'd like to welcome our panelists for today's discussion. We have with us today Rob Grunewald. He's an economist at the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. He also co-authored the report, Early Childhood Development, Economic Development with a High Public Return. Rob, welcome. Next, we have with us Bob Harbison, who is a retired corporate executive, but since retirement, he's a full-time early childhood advocate. He currently serves on the Smart Start Oklahoma Foundation Board. It's a statewide coalition that coordinates existing early childhood education programs to increase their effectiveness and cost efficiency. And he also serves on the local boards of Lawton and Oklahoma City to help raise awareness of the importance of early childhood development. And Bob, I want to extend a special thank you for taking a very long trip uh, up here to Mackinac Island, and uh, we wish your community the very best at this time. Thank you. <laughs> and finally joining us this morning is Carla Thompson, Vice President for Program Strategy at the W.K. Kellogg Foundation. In that role, she leads the education and learning and family economic security teams. Prior to joining the Kellogg Foundation, she was Deputy Director of the Office of Child Care at the Administration for Children and Families at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Carla, welcome and thank, thank you. you. And finally, the, the other important part of this uh, conversation is that we'd love for you to join this conversation with your questions. They passed out index cards as you were entering. If you have a question for any of our panelists, just uh, hold your card up and someone will pick it up. And hopefully we'll have some time at the end of the conversation. So let's start with what, what we know. We know that one in four kids in Michigan is growing up in poverty. Very important number to know. We also know that until recently, 30,000 eligible four-year-olds were unable to attend preschool because of a lack of funding. With the 65 million additional dollars, uh, four grade start included in the budget that will open up about 16,000 new slots. Another important fact, three of the most rigorous long-term studies found a range of returns between four and nine dollars for every dollar invested in early learning programs for low-income children. So if that's the case, where do we go from here? What does Michigan do to prepare all kids in Michigan to inherit the state, to populate our workforce, and to make Michigan a leader in both education and the economy? And that's what this discussion is about today. So Carla, I want to start with you. When we talk about early childhood education, why is that so important? for low-income children. Help us set the stage for, for why that's an important point. Sure, well at the Kellogg Foundation, good morning everyone. At the Kellogg Foundation, we believe that investing in early childhood education is critical to turning that corner for low-income children, particularly because we know that children who do not have high-quality early childhood experiences often are not successful academically, which leads to long-term adult success in the workforce. And so for us, focusing on children prenatal to eight and having our investments targeted around supporting their families, creating quality teaching <clears throat> workforce, and then making sure that systems are aligned to support them both at home, at school, and in the community at large is a key investment strategy for us. Children of that age, what better way is there for society than to invest in them? And so for us, we take that challenge and we invest heavily in ensuring that all children have access to high quality, not just any early childhood experience, but high quality early childhood education. And, and that's an important distinction. Um, Rob, when we talk about early education experiences and we talk about a return on investment, having a high quality education experience isn't the same as just being in a room and coloring. We're talking about a very specific sort of educational experience for kids. That's true. The, the, the studies that you cited that have the, the high rate of return uh, all had teachers who were master teachers. In other words, they had well, they were well trained. They understand how to intervene with kids in a natural state of play in order to enhance their environment, increase their vocabulary, uh, learn more. And also, uh, those are programs that have relatively low ratios of children uh, to those teachers. 
and that they're adopting and using a research-backed curriculum. So these elements of quality that are built into an early childhood program that are essential, and if you want to achieve that high rate of return, you have to put the type of ingredients into that mix in order to uh, achieve school readiness and school preparation. We, we're seeing an interesting convergence in Michigan right now. Um, the business community is supporting early childhood education. We've seen a lot of support from the foundation community. The legislature is supporting early childhood education. And there's been a similar convergence in Oklahoma. Bob, tell us a little bit about the Oklahoma experience. What came together, what forces came together to make uh, the state take this leap to providing early education for all kids? Uh, I, I usually introduce myself as a being a retired corporate guy um, who uh, has spent the past 21 years as a full-time early childhood advocate. And um, uh, my story uh, started in Tulsa uh, through the Chamber of Commerce and, um, in uh, 1991. Uh, and they were doing, uh, things were really hot in, in Tulsa at that time. And, and they were looking at workforce development issues. <clears throat> And uh, as they worked back, they started hearing about this notion of, of school readiness and the uh, uh, increasing discussion uh, in public schools and with public school people about uh, school readiness and um, uh, wanted to do something about it. And uh, I had just retired, and, and they talked me into um, uh, coming over and, and moving into a cubicle and, and taking a look at it. Uh, Tulsa situation and come up with a strategy, and we did. And the fact that the chamber uh, established that uh, as a high priority in, in uh, 1991 was uh, pretty bizarre, uh, ac actually, in terms of how other chambers looked at it. But I'll remind you that uh, about that same time, the National Governors Association listed their goals 2000 and the, the 10 goals and the number one item had to do with kids entering school ready to learn. And, and, and my point to it, uh, as I started familiarizing myself with the literature, is that it just made so much sense. The whole notion of, of kids being seriously behind, understanding the notion of how difficult it is to catch up. Now, the human capacity to catch up is, is pretty e enormous uh, with a heroic intervention with a child. But public education is not about heroic interventions. It's about a teacher and 20 kids. And, and so they, they start out behind, they stay behind, and then bad things start happening. And I look, tend to look at things, and, and still from a sort of a business guy, corporate perspective, and, and several things really bother me about that. And one of them is it, it drives me nuts to think about a, a desk that is a fixed cost. And a little kid walks into it in first grade and is a 50 percenter. And, and, and they will make progress, but they'll still be behind because it, it's very, very difficult to gain more than nine months. And, and uh, so that was sort of my personal experience. The Tulsa experience, I think, uh, moved out through the rest of the state to a certain extent. We never had a huge referendum on early childhood. It was more take the toolkit that we have and, and people working on the pieces because it's, it's not like early childhood is anyone's job. It's spread out among different state agencies, a lot of different uh, organizations. and. Um, we just started galvanizing that and, and uh, understanding what we wanted to have and then looking for opportunities to act on what was presented to us. And, and of course, uh, we've, we've made some really significant uh, improvements over the, the past 15 years, which we'll probably cover later. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Rob, we're hearing from Bob that the business community was an important player. And in Michigan, the same is true. But at the end of the day, when we talk about early education, we're talking about money. And there are limited funds. How should a state like Michigan prioritize where early education falls when it comes to funding priorities? Well, 
you know, in terms of prioritizing early childhood, you know, kids don't vote. And so there tends not to be, you know, they're not directly able to influence their future in that way. Uh, but I think as a state, and we're realizing this uh, particularly in Minnesota as well, among the business community there too, that if we're thinking about the future of our economy uh, 15, 20, 25 years down the road, that economy is going to need well-trained workers. And the productivity of that workforce uh, 15, 20 years down the road is going to depend on what's happening in our communities for young children uh, today. And I think that there's a growing awareness that if we are to make these investments today, we're going to benefit from that future. Because nationally, demographics show, uh, relative to the demands for workers going forward, is that we're going to have a slower growing workforce over the next few decades. And in 20 years, we're going to need every worker uh, not only to come on and uh, be ready to take on any particular job, but we're going to need a very well-skilled workers to take on jobs in healthcare, engineering, information technology. So I think as economists, as we look at the labor markets, where the future is going, uh, these key investments today are going to pay off a large dividends going forward. And that's not to mention the, the savings to a state budget. Uh, so I think we need to sit back, really look at this research, and as a community, continue to prioritize investments in early childhood. Mm -hmm. Carla, we talk a lot about the workforce and, and uh, how important early education is for that future workforce. But let's talk about societal impact as well. When we, when we talk about educating children early, how does that impact society beyond the workforce in terms of public safety and community stability? Well, when you think about it, we consider early childhood education part of our two-generation strategy. The investments in young children so that they have high-quality early learning experiences, that they learn the cognitive as well as the social-emotional skills that are necessary on how to engage with adults, how to engage with their peers, how to operate in a structured space. And so we see that learning helping them move forward into adulthood and therefore having adults who know how to play well together, having adults who know how to communicate effectively, having adults who use their curiosity to learn new skills and develop. And so for us, early childhood is the microcosm of what the world should be like. You play, you learn, you have fun, you engage with other people, but then you also invest back into your local community. And so we've been working with communities across the nation, particularly here in Michigan, around how we can have children and the things that are happening in early childhood also be reflective of what's happening in the workforce development as we're encouraging their families to go back to school and to gain better skills. And so for us, a society that invests in their young children children is a healthy society. Uh, Bob, I want to come back to you. Uh, during the audio piece we were all listening to, when um, one of the speakers mentioned prenatal, uh, you went, yes. <laughs> you gave a very emphatic nod. In Oklahoma, are you expanding your focus beyond just uh, pre-K education and, and looking at that prenatal to career scope? We're really expanding it uh, two ways. Um, f since the time that uh, I started getting involved in, and, and others involved in it, you know, at that time we thought of schools starting at first grade. So, and and yet the school system was sitting there with kindergarten, and and very few of the kids in full day kindergarten, pre K, very few kids in pre K, and on down. Well, we've really more or less fixed to pre-K and kindergarten. We, we now have 98% of our kids are in a full day K. We have 80% of our uh, kids uh, in a pre-K program and 70% and of those are, are in a full day program. And we're still ramping up in terms of pre-K over the past 15 years. But we're really focusing on uh, birth 2-4 now. Uh, we've sort of reached a tipping point in the schools. We have, we have over 2,000 uh, kids, which is 4% of our kids are in three-year-old programs, and, this, and they get no funding for that. So school districts are just uh, fi finding a way, tightening it up, Title I money, what have you, but are, 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 are going after the threes. We have a, a, uh, a state program right now uh, 
that is a public-private deal uh, 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 focusing on birth to four, and uh, we have about 2,600 kids in the state that are in, in these uh, centers. We uh, have a pot of $25 million that is $10 million from the state and $15 million from the private sector. That's a pretty good match for the state to, to put attention there. And, and we're basically uh, wrapping additional funding around uh, existing programs, mainly three-year-olds and Head Start and early Head Start, to do a, a very high quality program uh, similar to what is being done in uh, a network across the state of, of uh, Educare uh, centers. There are now uh, 18 in the country. And uh, so we're really trying to, to establish those centers to represent the package of best practices that we could do. And, and those include prenatal. They include uh, uh, pregnant uh, women, uh, and we try to get engaged early in the program, and then uh, the uh, early Head Start kids, which would be birth to three. I think the lesson for us is if we look at the circumstances of a birth cohort in Oklahoma, about 54,000 kids a year, and we see the socioeconomic circumstances of those kids in a state where two-thirds of the births are paid for by Medicaid, so the financial circumstances of the little child coming in, two out of three, have at least one significant risk factor and, and, and usually uh, two or three more. Uh, we've got to focus more on, on birth to three a and we've got to have some kind of contact with the parents. And right now, we're, those Medicaid births, we're reaching and offering some kind of, some kind of help, some kind of insight about what they're about to about one out of seven. So, you know, we're missing an opportunity to really leverage up the involvement of parents that probably are not ready for what they're, they're doing with, with their small child and, and really trying to focus more attention on the earliest years. Carla, I saw you nod when, when Bob mentioned parental intervention and involvement as well. What are your thoughts about that? Well, family engagement is one of our key strategies. For as much as we talk about early childhood education, we cannot forget parents because children don't live in silos. They live in families. And so it's important to keep families engaged. You know, long in the education discourse, we've talked about parents being children's first teacher, and we firmly believe that in early childhood. And so if they're the first teacher, you must keep them engaged throughout their educational process. One of the ways we find parental engagement or family engagement to be successful is when we work with parents around what to expect in an early childhood education system. Where can they go to find high quality early childhood education? What sort of questions should they be asking the school? What sort of opportunities should they be exposing their child to? How should they read to their children, particularly if they have low literacy skills themselves, and the importance of being actively engaged with the hopes that parents will continue to be engaged throughout a child's academic experience. And so for us, family engagement is a number one strategy. Looking at where the state is now, we have this wonderful investment of $65 million into early childhood education. It's an incredible investment. It's, it's, it's such a leap you know, for the state to take. But that still leaves a gap in services for um, at-risk kids. Bob, you mentioned public-private partnerships. And, and Rob, I want to turn to you. Is that a way for the state to close the gap? We, we have to continue looking forward at how to serve these kids. So is that a, a direction the state should be looking? It's certainly part of the solution. Uh, Public-private partnerships bring together uh, resources from the private sector, which can be very valuable to leveraging resources in the, the solution, solutions in early childhood. Uh, so for example, in Michigan, uh, local collaborations uh, through the Great Start system can be a way where business leaders can come to the table. Another example in Detroit, uh, First Children's Finance is an organization I actually work with uh, back in Minneapolis. And this is an organization that helps bring business leaders to the table that uh, bring expertise around uh, how to help a child care director, let's say, 
uh, operate, which is a business. And uh, folks who are running early education programs or childcare programs tend not to come from a business background. And so when business leaders come to the table, they can provide information, resources, and, uh, and be able to provide strategy around finance, accounting, uh, marketing, all these type of skills that can help a program uh, work better. So there are a number of ways of where uh, public and private collaborations can come together and help to promote uh, benefits. So for example, just one more example in Minnesota, a group of business leaders uh, created the Minnesota Early Learning Foundation and raised $20 million. And they use these resources to invest in our state's quality rating system, which helps uh, families understand how to shop for quality in early education and also to uh, provide some information to our state about how to improve our access uh, to early childhood education. And because that bit <clears throat> group of business leaders came together, they're able to provide essentially an honest broker of this knowledge, uh, essentially a third party, make these investments, research them, come to the state with more information about how our state should move forward. And our state has moved forward this legislative session as well. Bob, does the business community remain engaged in Oklahoma? Do they continue to be a part of this conversation as you're continuing to expand early education? Yes, and one of the things I, one of the things I wanted to mention, uh, piggybacking on, on what Rob said, the a development that we're seeing is our foundations and business people really working more together, as opposed to what I would characterize as uh, potential big funders owning projects. So right now, uh, some of our foundations are our leading fundraisers to generate money. And, and for example, in the, the program that I mentioned a while ago, um, one of our foundations basically assured the legislature when they asked us, how do we know if, if we put this $10 million in, which is a year-to-year -year deal, that we're going to see the $15 million. And he, he basically guaranteed that he would be the sweep account, uh, that the private sector would hit the $15 million. Uh, as far as the eye could see. And, and in fact, that he'd be delighted if they upped the ante. And, and we would c continue with our, our, our matching rate. But the point is, he, he is also uh, working with the, commu the uh, uh, com means community, I'll say it, business and, uh, and uh, foundation leaders to to, to uh, raise the pot. He, uh, he's not interested in owning it, but he wants to backstop it. Uh, the other thing that we've run into is at the local level, we sell the investment uh, idea. And it goes something like this. When we were ramping up pre-K and kindergarten, these things are in the school funding formula. And school districts were having trouble, though, with space. We were adding, in effect, a grade and a half uh, over time. And space was a real issue. And uh, I, I talked to more than one uh, community leader or uh, foundation. I said, the only difference, the only thing between the school district receiving X hundreds of thousands of dollars a year for these programs uh, and doing that is you're helping them with the facilities. Or, or outfitting classrooms. Well, the leverage is enormous. It's like a payback of, of one year or two max, and then it's just like a, an in, in annuity that keeps on giving. Um, so uh, it's been fairly easy to drag uh, corporate leaders, foundations to the table. But the, the real significance is their willingness to, to link arms and, and, and create a, 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 some real momentum a, as opposed to, to doing onesie twosie things by themselves. Fairly easy to drag people to the table. So we'll see if we can do a little arm twisting after the session. Carla, I want to ask you, in terms of infrastructure here in Michigan, in terms of providing high quality um, early education, is the state in, in, in good shape? Do, is this $65 million um, going to, can we use it in an effective way right now? Is the infrastructure there? I think absolutely. There's a 
great possibility in Michigan that we're going to do wonderful things for our children. We have the public investment that was just announced. We have philanthropic investments, both from the Kellogg Foundation and a number of other Michigan-based foundations. We have the political will, the room is full. We have the ability to bring the discourse to the forefront of our conversation. And so I think Michigan is absolutely in the right place to make this happen. It's about building internal capacity. It's about acknowledging where there are some weak points so that additional supports can be provided. It's about keeping the conversation going. And most of all, is around continuing the investment so that it's not just a one-time investment, but it's an annual investment that's increasing over time because we're seeing the benefits of our labor over time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Rob, in, uh, talk a little bit about the impact um, in terms of the state's attractiveness when we talk about investing in early education. What could that mean for people who are looking at Michigan as a place to move a business or move their family? What kind of impact does that have? Well, earlier I talked about you know, long-term impact, you know, labor force productivity years down the road, also cost savings to our school system reducing remedial education. Well, that's a fairly near-term cost. Other costs also tend to be long-term in terms of reductions in crime and also increased tax revenue once children reach the labor force. But there's some real immediate uh, benefits to having a high quality early learning system. First, it's attractive to families to come into a state that has opportunities for their kids. Uh, also for businesses, businesses realize uh, that when their parents have access to high quality childcare settings, they're more likely to be more productive in their work, they're less likely to be absent. And so businesses are starting to ask about the availability of quality childcare in the communities where they're looking to set up. Uh, but primarily, if you're able to uh, help children prepare for school, I think businesses and, and folks who are looking at moving to a state understand that if kids come to that kindergarten door ready to succeed, uh, they're on a trajectory towards success. And that if you have a stronger school readiness, school preparation, you're going to have a stronger school system and therefore a you know, very attractive environment to encourage families to move in and also businesses. Bob, what kind of impacts is Oklahoma, is Oklahoma seeing um, from this investment in, in early education? Um, <clears throat> Professor Bill Gormley at uh, Georgetown University wanted to look at um, our pre-K program about five years after we had uh, implemented uh, uh, universal access at 98. And, um, so that was five years after we implemented it. And um, they, um, Tulsa Public Schools was willing to support the project. And it's often referred to as, as the Tulsa Pre-K. It's, it's not Tulsa Pre-K, it's Oklahoma Pre-K as, as done in many districts in the state. And so they were looking at about uh, 3,000 Pre-K children and, and, and not just poor kids, but all the kids that were in the program. And um, all the kids made significant gains versus kids that did not have the preschool opportunity. Gains were tremendously significant among the Hispanic children and, and African American uh, community and, and, and poor kids in, in general. But um, it, 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 I encourage anyone to um, to Google the uh, Georgetown study or Bill Gormley and take a look at the uh, study because it, uh, it, it is really convincing. Uh, the uh, uh, NEAR, the uh, National Institute for Early Education Research, uh, came along two years later and, and looked at about eight of our districts and, and basically validated the Gormley uh, results. So we feel really good about that investment. And uh, uh, through our, uh, in Oklahoma, we have four educators uh, right now, uh, sort of a contest between the George Kaiser uh, Family Foundation in Tulsa and Susie Buffett's Foundation in Omaha. So we have four, uh, and Omaha has two and another one coming up. But it's a part of an 18, uh, center network that is a very, very high quality, birth to uh, five, usually about 200 children in the centers. And all of the 18 centers 
are using uh, the, the identical assessment schedule through the, uh, the time that the child is, is in the centers. So we have data on uh, over 3,000 children right now uh, around the country. And the network is, you know, is we have other educators coming up out of the ground, so we're, we're soon going to have 25. I think it's going to turn into the most significant research project that we have on really large scale, seeing what the potential is for these kids, because we can, we can look at it in terms of kids that are with us one year, two years, three years, four years, and we're all measuring uh, the same way, the same instruments, and uh, we really have a, are accumulating a lot of data. Carla, should Michigan, as we look ahead and, and, and figure out where the state needs to go, is that P20 model really where we need to aim? Is that what we need to be looking at? I would say absolutely. The, pre, P, the P20 model looks at our entire educational continuum. And if we want to continue to maintain our status as the leading country in the world, we have to invest in education across the board, both in early childhood and the traditional K-12, but particularly in higher ed around our teacher professional development. If we want the best environments for our children, we need to ensure that the teachers working in those classrooms are the most highly skilled, they have access to continuous professional development and they're working in the communities that are most in need. We want our highly experienced teachers working in our poorest communities or in our communities that are at the highest levels of academic failure and we want our novice teachers to be able to learn from those highly skilled professionals and so for me a P20 model is the ultimate educational model and Michigan should absolutely focus on that. Will that require a, a, a big shift though in our thinking in our funding priorities and how we've structured education. In the we state. have the infrastructure here in Michigan. What we need to do is open up the conversation and begin to align our system so that we're all speaking the same language. We all have unified goals and we understand what's important for us here in Michigan so that we can support generations to come. Mm -hmm. So it's here. We just need to make it work better. Go ahead, Bob. I use a, a business metaphor that I, I use quite often. It's, it's what occurred to me a, a long time ago when I started this. But I, th I think of Common Ed as kind of like a manufacturing plant. And we've got a raw material problem coming in that we need to really address. And what would a business do if they were make, trying to create a high quality product and they have a raw material problem? They'd work at, the, work at it. We also have a, a pretty significant, I'd say darn significant, scrappage problem at the other end. Not just the dropouts, but much lower performance uh, uh, coming out the other end. And um, if we were better cost accountants, and I'm, I'm not just a bean counter, but if we were better cost accountants and really understood the costs that we are all paying for the consequences. Whereas you look at those outcomes, the least bad thing for a really significant group of our kids is uh, that they're going to end up in a lousy job. That's the least bad outcome. The, the, worst, the worst outcome, murder one. And you end up paying a, a few million dollars over years uh, on that one. But. Um, you know, we, we, we have to work at both ends. We need to, to really work on the raw material end of the thing through early childhood to get the maximum out of our plant. Otherwise, we have that, that seat that we're paying for, the desk that we're paying for, and, and the little kid sits down in it the first time as a 50 percenter and sort of stays that way through to the end. And, and, and I, I would submit that the scrappage problem will improve dramatically if we keep that focus on. Mm -hmm. Rob, I think we have a few questions to take. Um, from an economic standpoint, and I think Bob has alluded to some of this, what does Michigan stand to lose by not making these investments in early education? Well, it's, it's interesting to look backward in time. Uh, there's one analysis by Robert Lynch, he's an economist uh, in Washington, D.C., and he looked uh, ahead, <clears throat> let's say, if, for example, our state makes investments, such as you are in the state, uh, you know, increased investment in preschool, 
what impact does that have on the state's budget in 2050? And one experiment we did, uh, you know, using his analysis, we looked backwards in time uh, for Michigan and also Minnesota and used this thought experiment. What if we had made notable high quality investments in preschool early education back in the early 1970s? And when this book came out, it was about 2006, 2007, uh, our states were dealing with some, some budget issues at that time. And what we're beginning to see is that if we're able to map out and do this uh, bean counting uh, process more accurately, if those investments had been made, our budget troubles would have been much smaller uh, 30 years later had we seen those investments. So that's a way to think about the returns that would be left on the table if we are not making those investments today. The productivity of the workforce won't be as high. We are, our state budgets, our local community budgets uh, will not be as robust. It will be struggling you know, 20, 30 years down the road with how to make these uh, balances meet. Okay. We have a few questions from the audience. Um, are there adjustments employers should or could make to facilitate um, family engagement for, say, the zero to three years and beyond? For instance, family leave. Carla? Well, we have a major family leave crisis in this country. We don't really support parents around what they need to do in order to support their young child. Sick days, teacher conference days, maternity leave, paternity leave, those are some of the things that we have to address as a nation and as a state if we really want to have authentic family engagement. I think there should be no pushback when a parent says, I'd like to spend half a day in my child's classroom so that I can engage with their teacher and we can talk about what my child needs academically and what sort of supports I can offer. The fact that that's not a conversation that happens in most places of employment is a barrier that we have to face as a society. And so, yes, family leave policies are critical in order for us to really have a high quality early childhood experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just a, one piece to it, in terms of how businesses where they're able uh, to allow so for some flexible work schedules that can allow for the parenting, uh, the job of parenting to go a bit easier. Uh, but also some businesses uh, look to bringing in a parent educator during, let's say, the lunch hour and spend time with parent employees and have a discussion around uh, the struggles and, and opportunities to learn more about child development and strategies for parenting. So that's, that's uh, an avenue some businesses have taken. Mm -hmm. There's also some, bus some businesses are also working on creating early childhood spaces within their buildings so that families have easier access mm -hmm. to their child's classroom and teacher. And so there's some tax incentives that work that way as well. Is there also um, opportunity for us to look at um, more on the education side, providing more wraparound services as, as part of what the state provides in Great Start? And some, the state has some good models around wraparound services. For instance, for Head Start programs or Head Start children, they have the ability to access the child care development fund so that they can provide the before and after school care. And so we see lots of models around blended state and federal funding and local funding to support a longer extended classroom experience for children in order to allow families to work. Uh, Rob, I think this is a, co a question for you. Uh, can you provide any insight about the amount per child to provide a quality pre-K education? Um, should this amount be more than per pupil funding for K-12 education? It, you know, it's a, it's a very good question, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about two key investments. Uh, first, home visiting uh, before getting to pre-K. So in terms of having uh, intervention where you are counseling an at-risk expectant mother, uh, that this, these investments can range from two to about $4,000 per year, uh, depending on the intensity that that family needs, and often stays with that family for about two, two, three years. In preschool, uh, once you do the cost accounting and you know actually how much does it cost for uh, a program to run half day school year, that that's around about five thousand uh, dollars, and that uh, if you're going to be doing a wraparound uh, program that's more of a full day program, that's going to depend upon the cost structure in the community. So you might be adding on another three thousand dollars to that, or if you get into an urban environment, let's say in Minneapolis, St. Paul, if we're to provide a high quality full year program that that would be over ten thousand dollars per year mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and bob what kind of investments are you making in oklahoma 
Ours would run uh, lower than the, than the number be, uh, that Rob mentioned because we're usually uh, on our uh, teacher payer like 49th or 50th. I think we've gotten out of the out of the bottom. So our numbers are lower than that, but we're we're spending uh, between the. Uh, state dollars and and the local ad valorem tax dollars in our formula, we're, we're spending around uh, 8,500 for a full day pre-K, which you know the way our funding formula works, uh, and we're we're paying the pre-K program essentially identical with like first grade for pupil expenditures in kindergarten. I think this is part of the conversation about um, uh, shifting to more of a P20 model and someone in, in the audience. I, do, I oh, will sorry. add, I, I, I really believe that uh, this is an area where higher quality, the increment for the higher quality really has the incremental higher results. I think that's what, we're, you know, if we were doing over on, on Head Start, We'd say, you know, you, you can't do it with a half-day program at age four at this kind of uh, funding. You need more money for a longer day for a more intense engagement. Mm -hmm. So quality of the, go of the dosage is really important. Um, quick question to Rob, and then I think we're running out of time. Um, someone asked a question about redirecting funds. If we're looking at a P20 model, is it a matter of redirecting money that's going to higher education or uh, K through 12 into early ed? Will we still see the same return on investment or are we really talking about just making an increased investment in pre-K and continuing to fund K through 12, higher ed at increased levels as well? Uh, the caution about you know, taking too much downstream and putting it upstream is that you get the high return if you have complementary investments following those early gains. So once children arrive at kindergarten, they're going to high quality experience there. They're able to build on those, those early gains. I mean, certainly with an entire state budget, uh, you can look at the range of priorities that are in those, those funds and strategize about how you might redirect. And for example, you know, one area, since we're running out of time, corrections and the amount, the amount that we put into our jail system around certain sentencing, just a fraction of redirecting some of those funds early will in the long run save you the money in corrections downstream. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As we wrap up, um, just very quickly from each of you, we're in a room full of decision makers and thought leaders and business leaders. What does this group need to leave this session with? What do they need to know about early education? Carl, I'll start with you. Sure. So my suggestion is to continue doing what you're doing. The investment that Michigan is making in early childhood education is going to have long-term effects for our, our state. And so to continue in that investment, early childhood education is one of the best things that we can do as a society. And I will continue to encourage you to invest in early childhood education, visit an early childhood education program, get to know that experience, because once you walk into that room, you'll never leave it. Bob, your final words. Get, get engaged. Get engaged at whatever your comfort level is, but and, and validate what you've heard today, and by talking to, to others and talking to young educators, uh, educators of young children, and what you're going to hear a lot about is school readiness problems, and and the fact that what the shape the kids are in when they come in the door, and and get engaged in fixing that. Rob. Continue investing in home visiting and pre-K. Align your child care subsidy system more to quality. And continue the public-private partnerships. And business energy and insights is extremely valuable to moving this issue forward. Well, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us for this very early session today. If you're interested in continuing uh, a conversation about education, you can join the lunch discussion. Um, it's being sponsored by the Skillman Foundation, Detroit, the final frontier of education uh, reform. It'll be moderated by Mary Kramer, publisher of Crane's Detroit Business, and she's a Skillman Foundation trustee. The panelists for that discussion will be Governor Snyder, John Covington, Chancellor of the Michigan Education Achievement Authority, and Dan Varner, CEO of Excellent Schools Detroit. Right. We hope to see you there again. Thank you so much for being a part of this important discussion. Have a great day. Thank you.
Thank you so much. Yeah. It was great.